I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. Itamar, a settlement on the West Bank of Israel. Itamar, a home on Shabbat on Friday night. People sleeping inside. Five family members are now dead, attacked by a suspect terrorists linked to Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade, which is a revolutionary wing of Fatah, the ruling party of the Palestinian Authority. The father, the mother, three children, including infants, were murdered by knife play by one or more attackers. Aaron Klein of uh, the Aaron Klein Investigative Show at WABC also the author of Manchurian, a best-selling me- author of Ben Manchurian President is here to discuss exactly what we know about this attack, why it happened, and what is being done in the pursuit of the killers. Aaron, this is, of course, appalling. Where is Itamar? It's appalling. Uh, Itamar is in the northern west bank around the area of Shrem, also known as Nablus, which happens to be a major stronghold of the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade. And this was a family uh, living in an area right near the security fence that leads outside of their community, which very clearly is where the Palestinian assailants came in. And I think it's very telling to look at the specifics of the attack. The assailants, apparently they entered the Fogel's home, that's the name, uh, Udi the father, 37, Ruth the mother, 36, 10-year-old boy, Yoav, 4-year-old, Elad, three-month-old daughter Hadas, all murdered in cold blood. The the family, and this is very common in the Jewish communities of the West Bank, because people see this area as a war zone. But actually, when you go into the territories, into the Jewish communities there, those living there feel very protected because they live uh, surrounded by Israeli defense forces, surrounded by a security uh, barrier that goes around their community. So it's actually very common. I know this is shocking. Very common for families there to leave their doors open during the week, and in particular on Friday night, on Shabbat, because these people, a lot of the people who live in these communities have large families. Some of their, the children go out. So the assailants go into the door of this home, which was the first home in the row of homes near the security fence. They went through the door into the living room, where apparently they did not notice, this is miraculous, a six-year-old boy sleeping on the couch. He survived. They didn't see him. Instead, they continued on first to the master bedroom, where they slashed the throat of the father, Udi, 37. He was sleeping right next to him in the master bedroom in a carriage was the baby, three months old girl, slashed her throat. Then the mother, Ruth, the forensic experts piece this together, she hears something going on. She's in the bathroom at the time near the bedroom. She comes out of the bathroom and is stabbed in the doorway. Now, the evidence shows that she fought with the terrorists, but they ended up murdering her. Then they turn to the next bedroom, which is the children's bedroom. Forensic evidence finds that, that they saw the, the son, Yoav, 11 years old, 10 or 11 years old, reading in bed. He actually, if you, uh, there are gory images right now on the Internet. Israel released them. You can still see the book that he was reading next to his bloody body. He was stabbed to death. In the room, also miraculously, there was a two-year-old in bed asleep, did not get murdered, but then, uh, uh, but then next to that, another child stabbed through the heart. Now, there was a 12-year-old girl, the daughter, who was returning home from Friday night activities. This was going on 10.30 p.m. Jerusalem time, Friday night. She returns uh, at about 11.45, the door is locked, which is unusual. She usually comes in, apparently, the door is uh, open Friday nights. So she goes to her neighbor. The neighbor then, with her, goes back to the, the house, knocks on the door loudly, because remember, there are two kids in there sleeping, uh, they, 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 sleeping through all of this. One of the, the children wakes up and then opens the door, and then this 12-year-old goes in and finds exactly uh, the scene that we are now seeing on the Internet. Well, apparently, the terrorist escaped uh, locked the door, crawled out the window. Now, the information, well, actually, the Al-Aqsa Brigade, the military wing of Fatah, at first officially took responsibility, but then, very strangely, a few hours later, they rescinded that responsibility. Now, my information is that this was planned and orchestrated, the logistics of it, by the Al-Aqsa Brigade, again, military wing of Fatah, and that the assailants were individuals who double sometimes for Fatah, but also as sleeper cells for 
Hamas. So very interesting will be what is announced in the news once the assailants are killed. The IDF knows exactly who carried this out. They have the names. They have the leaders of this cell. Um, let's see what ends up in the media in the next 24, 48 hours. Where do we believe the killers are now, and who is running this operation? The intelligence, the command and control. Is it all the way back to Gaza? It, it's interesting. The al Aqsa Brigade uh, sources that I talked to in Nablus, they claim that this was not coming, uh, that this was not sanctioned by the PA. I don't believe it. I think that, the, but this is my thinking, was, was sanctioned by the PA, but it was orchestrated by uh, the Al-Aqsa Brigade's leadership in Nablus, which, by the way, the leadership there doubles as Fatah security forces. They are the Fatah security forces. They, uh, during the day, they serve in Fatah militias. At night, they're Al-Aqsa Brigade's leaders. They were the planning of this. They don't need help from Gaza. They're actually very good at planning in Nablus in the northern West Bank. But if, uh, for them to claim that this was not sanctioned by the PA is not believable because they are security chiefs in that area. They answer to Fatah. They answer to the Palestinian Authority, which has been, uh, first of all, very nervous about the turn of events in Egypt, in the greater Middle East, where the United States abandoned our ally Mubarak, uh, Muslim Brotherhood rise. This favors Hamas. Fatah now needs to orient itself away from the West, away from the United States, and possibly one of the ways to do that is terrorism. Now, also, there has been noise in the last few weeks. We personally reported on this in the last few days of a new possible peace plan coming from Bibi, while at the same time Obama urging more concessions from the Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, including uh, evacuation of settlements, including even some, uh, some accommodation on the Jordan Valley, which, by the way, there was a shooting by Fatah in the Jordan Valley. It didn't make the news in America, but two days ago. So this could be connected to, we have seen time and again, the PA have this dual strategy on the one hand of negotiations, which they're not even doing now anymore. Now instead, uh, uh, this, this diplomatic assault with unilateral recognition, on the one hand, on the other hand, it has worked time and again for Fatah, and that is ratcheting it up pressure on the Jewish communities in the West Bank by carrying out these terrorist atrocities. The timing, Aaron, you're linking the timing of this attack to the leaked story that Bibi Netanyahu is preparing a unilateral offer for, in some fashion, rearranging the relationship with the Palestinian Authority. Is that correct? He, 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 there is a story out there that it might happen, Area A, Area B, Area C, and the Nablus re, uh, uh, division launches this attack. Is that correct? Not only is this story out there, the PA knows about it. In fact, uh, the uh, Bibi's office has been in direct touch, according to my sources, with the PA about this plan. They told him they will publicly reject it. So it's not just reports. The Palestinians have been talking in communication with Bibi about, and his office at least, about this plan. And I want to point out the overall incitement in the Palestinian media. Even today, we're talking about just after the attack today, Abbas renamed a town square in the center in the West Bank in a Palestinian city of Nablus, of Ramallah, renamed it to a notorious Palestinian terrorist, one of the most famous, infamous Palestinian terrorists, Dalia Maghrabi, who in 1978 hijacked a bus and murdered 35 Israeli civilians. Also in the last few days, Abbas gave, as part of a larger PA campaign uh, to aid the so-called Shahids and martyrs, those that would be the Palestinians dying while killing Jews, uh, he gave yet again another the family of another Palestinian terrorist $2,000 and constant incitement in the Palestinian media, a football game, uh, this uh, coming up in the next few weeks, a football tournament by the PA, is named after Wafa Adris, who was the first Palestinian suicide bomber. This was January 2002, uh, killed one, injured more than 150 in Jerusalem. I mean, I can go on and on the incitement at the highest levels. And yes, the PA not only knew about this plan, they were in negotiation and uh, it, it, it is the continued PA campaign that we've seen for decades, or even leading up, we saw in Annapolis, Bush's negotiation uh, to create a Palestinian state in Annapolis, 2007, 48 hours before Fatah security forces carry out a bloody massacre. So uh, it, it's the same old campaign under Arafat now coming about yet again under Abbas.